Welcome to the UAC podcast this week. Uh, Joseph Johnson here, as always, uh, with uh, two of our authors from Fringe Methodologies uh, in, in High Performance and Health, uh, Jed <coughs> Smith and Dr. Peter Smolinoff. Thanks, guys, for joining me again here. I think it's our fifth edition. Uh, appreciate you guys taking the time out during this uh, uh, COVID lockdown to, uh, to talk with me again about the book. So, uh, as we're going through the book, uh, you know, you guys did a, a chapter on the physical training, uh, where you know, what are the fringe ideas there? Uh, uh, newer concepts, maybe. Uh, and before we dive into those, we want to look at what's what the principles that all of those are based upon, or whatever the underlying foundation is, which is long-term athletic development. Uh, uh, this terminology gets used a bit in the United States, uh, but it really has never been modeled in any, you know, serious way. So we, you know, we, we really don't know what that actually means in a practical sense, I don't think. Um, but the, the Soviets probably were the first model for this. They had developed uh, schools for youngsters, uh, you know, depending on the sport uh, that the athlete might want to participate in. Um, they also talked about, you know, the development of even children, you know, how their physical education should be uh, conducted uh, to get them ready to train at, at, the, at the appropriate time. Uh, and also, you know, the training for the coaches and teachers that were involved in this, uh, you know, was fairly high level. It wasn't just anyone. You couldn't uh, coach a kid just because you had played the sport. You had to uh, undergo some training. Um, can you guys talk about this? Like, you know, the beginning, like the basis upon which the fringe methodologies would be developed. Yeah, you know, Joseph, I'll touch a little bit on that uh, first. Initially, um, LTAD models, that's, you know, those are the, that's the big buzz acronym in, in strength and conditioning, long-term athletic development. Um, and it, it's just because we're now talking about it doesn't mean it didn't exist really in the United States. And there's evidence of, um, we can go back in, um, you know, early or 19th century textbooks in the United States on, uh, you know, dumbbell training and, and so forth that was being done for uh, in, in schools, uh, early 20th century. In fact, um, I look at, you know, where I'm at the University of Northern Iowa, I actually went and did uh, research in our library and found out our whole physical education department, which I'm in, it initially started because kids were getting injured uh, strength training in schools in Iowa. And this was 1887, the very first instructor here at our university um, was put in place to try to help uh, when it came to free weight training in schools uh, within the state to make it safer and put in a systemized approach with starting out with gymnastics training body weight training, and then moving forth into dumbbell and free weight training. So really we can go back just in the state of Iowa here uh, in the United States at our university and see that um, it, we were doing long-term athletic development models as, as far back as 1887 right here uh, in Iowa. And that's interesting because you know, here I, you know, I'm a modern strength and conditioning uh, coach and professional here. And we just think that, oh, yeah, this is all new. Um, but, but this stuff has been around a while and people have been trying to systemize. Now, things have evolved. And, uh, you know, what we call, like Peter said in the last podcast, just because, you know, certain areas of the world call it fringe methodologies, doesn't necessarily, it's me, meaning it, it's fringe in another area. For example, um, kettlebells that uh, you know became so uh, big in the fitness industry over the last 15, 20 years. Kettlebells have been around a long time. Uh, in fact, they go uh, way back into history and, and, and obviously uh, the Russian culture used kettlebells uh, quite a bit. And I remember when they came over here in the United States as far as uh, this is fringe and everybody was, you know, needed to, to learn how to train with them properly. It really wasn't fringe and it's just reinvented. 
Um, so, or, or, you know, comes back out again, but, um, we'll talk a little bit about long-term athletic development. I, I know Peter probably has some opening comments as well on, on maybe the ideas where it came from in history. Yeah, Peter, if you would, I, you know, you've got that background there and you actually went through the program or the system yourself, uh, in the former Soviet Union, uh, what was the history there and what was that like uh, going through that? It's called now uh, American Development Model. Uh, uh, um, every um, national governing body under uh, United States Olympic Committee umbrella is now um, expected to publish these guidelines on their website. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a summary um, of uh, at, uh, how much you should be training, how, how many competitions you should be going to, um, limitations that you should be aware of uh, that are age specific. Uh, 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 this came from Canada, um, uh, where again, every sport on the Sport Canada uh, published uh, uh, long term athlete development guidelines. That was done by Istvan Bale uh, from Hungary, uh, a sports scientist who, who, brought, who brought this uh, concept to North America uh, from Eastern Europe. Uh, the, again, it, it was uh, uh, summarized for each sport in, in, in Canada, and then it spread into uh, many English-speaking countries, uh, Australia, United Kingdom, uh, South Africa, um, uh, United States before um, uh, the most advanced in this sense, Eastern European countries uh, 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 started this. Uh, uh, these, these are countries of Austria, Hungary, Czech Republic, Germany, um, then uh, Russia. Uh, but again, uh, there, there was nothing new about this even 100 years ago. The concept that is uh, probably as, uh, even more developed than, uh, than uh, in many sports in the West now uh, existed in in, um, in uh, South Korea, Japan, and China hundreds of years ago. And if you look at uh, the best, uh, for example, Taekwondo clubs in North America, this is what they provide. They provide more than 10 belts before you get to black belt, and then you get seven dance in black belt. Uh, this is long-term, seamless, stressless progression of long-term athlete development that includes not just competition results. That we, this is what we are suffering from in, in the West. We we measure our results <laughs> by our success in competition. Okay, but in, uh, to pass through through a very good uh, uh, system of Taekwondo clubs. Before you get to competition, before you get to sparring and combat, uh, for each belt you need to pass your fitness test. Okay, shuttle runs, push-ups, uh, sit-ups, um, fle flexibility, strength, and um, uh, uh, endurance and coordination. Uh, or then you pass a knowledge test, and only then. Uh, th then you pass a pumse test, which is a coordination. In karate, it's called uh, kato, which is a se set of movements. And only then you you do your uh, your sparring or your your real uh, uh, competition with the partner. So in summary, in summary, the, 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 that's uh, that, that's where still that practice exists. And for for most sports, it's still a fringe. Still. Uh, even in, in uh, our traditional Western wrestling, we wrestle at, at competitions, and very often participants are not uh, um, are not required to to reach uh, a very high level of strength, endurance, flexibility, and coordination, and the, and uh, that is best practice. So when we're talking about Soviet, uh, Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, they took these ancient practices of, lo of long-term uh, requirements for, uh, for, for, for participants so that every year you have very specific objectives for progression. 
and they created a system of, of fitness tests and system of support specific requirements through which you progress. So there are 11, um, 11 stages, age specific stages in fitness tests. Start from six years old, going through 11 age categories, and the last category is 70 plus. Uh, and that, that is integrated with a system of sport specific uh, requirements that start with three ranks that, re that require specific, uh, specific uh, uh, minutes, not only specific uh, places in competitions, but sp number of seconds uh, you run or swim a uh, specific distance. Okay. Uh, those three junior ranks, three senior ranks, and then four master ranks. So you go through at least 10 stages of, um, uh, of development. And uh, if you do it together with the fitness test, it means that every year you have a very specific, uh, achievable, very clear, healthy guidelines for development. You know uh, how many push-ups you need to be able to do, how many pull-ups you need to be able to do, uh, sit-ups, how fast you must be walking or running one mile or so, three miles or so, uh, and uh, what you need to know in terms of your knowledge of hygiene and some basic periodization. Uh, and then, so uh, you, every, every year you're very clear as a child, as a kid, as a child, as a teenager, um, on what to achieve this year in order to progress from your first steps in, in, in fitness and in every sport to the highest desirable level of performance. And, and Yosef, that's what's very unique about our book is for the first time, and this was not an easy task, as you know, um, trying to get those tables, those charts, uh, into our book. That was probably the most difficult part of, of, of our book. But Peter was able to get um, copies and translate all of those standards of long-term athletic development for testing that are used in Russia and all the way up to 70-year-olds. Uh, so this is not, this is not, uh, it doesn't end when you're done being an, an athlete they st which is very very unique about this culture we don't do that now this this is fringe in the united states for sure there's actual fitness standards and it's objective tests that you are trying to make standards to um ensure your well-being and your health after you're done being an athlete until you're 70 years old yosef and this is this is uh we're talking about real long-term athletic development, not from, you know, a, a young child who, who just started a sport to their, the end of their sport. This is all the way through your lifetime. So, uh, what, so that is useful for coach and for athletes because uh, a coach basically opens the book on, uh, on, on its last pages where we have these tables. If you're six years old, this is this is what you need to be able to do. <laughs> if 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 you're twelve years old, this is what you need to be able to do. But the more uh, but the most stressful thing is that this uh, twelve year old says, "Okay, open." How old are you? And the coach says, "Okay, I'm fifty. Okay, he opens up the uh, the table, and it says, "For fifty years old, this is what <laughs> this is how many push ups, pull ups." <laughs> you must be able to do <laughs> so this is a jet's concept um this this supports jet's concept of coaches uh working out with athletes on on uh, on the basic fitness level uh and uh, uh taking tests that are appropriate for their age this is also useful for families uh, because any grandparent and any parent together with their kids uh, can go outside with, with this uh, with this book and uh, they can they can do their uh, push-ups pull-ups uh, sit-ups uh, long 
long, um, long jumps, standing long jumps or uh, running long jumps, and they can walk or, or run a mile, and it tells them uh, how, how, uh, what the results should be at their age. Uh, we have to stress that this is uh, done after uh, not just a review, but a review of reviews of global testing systems. And we published the results of our research of global um, fitness tests. And we could not find anything that is more, um, more advanced and more integrated than, than this. Tests, these tests, uh, they're called GTO, uh, ready for labor and defense. They've been developed since 1930s. And regularly, they have been tested and modified with large groups of population, general population and athletes, and medical, medical and sports scientists and pedagogues, specialists in pedagogical science and medical science, modified these tests and optimized them. There were at least three major reviews before World War II after, and two after World War II. Two reviews were done after World War II. So these tests have been um, very carefully developed for many, many decades. And um, of course, they need improvement. And we, I think we mentioned it in the, in the second volume, we're gonna suggest more uh, advanced uh, um, additions to their tests. But the basics are in the, in the current book. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do have President's Test and President's Challenge in the United States. We have Eurofit in Europe. We can take elements um, of new innovations in this test and add to the, to, to the GTO. That's uh, absolutely necessary. For example, adding some um, spines um, um, like Cobra, basic Cobra exercise from spine routine for, from yoga. We, uh, is, is, is a good addition that was added to the president's test. It's good for, for everybody. It's good for uh, the, those who are overweight, those who have, whose health is not uh, uh, ideal. So we, it, it, these tests would, be, would benefit from, um, uh, I'd say, people f uh, from additions for people with special needs and those who, whose health is, is, is below average. But for for any person, still these, these tests are, are, are very useful, and we're looking to we're looking forward to, to creating a global a global system of, of 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 testing, fitness testing and programming that in the future, in the in the following um, 10, 10, 20 years, um, would be would be available to everyone around the world. Um, uh, uh, we we have. This is, this is one of the first steps with uh, our publication with updated uh, GTO tests and some uh, suggested addition from uh, American uh, president's tests and from European uh, Eurofit tests um, is, our, is, is one of the first steps uh, in, in creating a global system. Um, but there are also um, sports specific, uh, sports specific uh, programs that must be integrated with the with the with the system, uh, sh uh, like the the, the um, Sean Vick's uh, yoga for athletes that that's that that is created um, to to support fitness of, of uh, athletes in in a dozen uh, uh, in how many sports I think in ten or more sports right uh, Jed absolutely yeah um, yes yeah, so uh, basic uh, exercises from these routines should be integrated into uh, in, into this into this test to make it more uh, even more varied this gto test has more, more optional uh, activities than any other systems so it's quite quite large there are a lot of options but even more options could be added from eastern um, health and fitness um, systems such as yoga uh, tai chi Tsugun and other um, um, uh, healthy, healthy fitness, uh, uh, health and fitness systems that are becoming part of of, of Western of uh, Western culture, but are not yet. Maybe maybe just yoga is now. Mm -hmm. So, 
And, and you know what, Peter, I want to add a little bit too on, uh, so, so the idea of, and we could get really far into um, the testing and recruitment um, and how that uh, occurs in different parts of the world. And, you know, using the, the GTO, uh, it's, it's also a method of identifying talent and then, you know, a, a, a placing, you know, children in the right sports and things like that. But, you know, the, the, the idea that, that this is fringe with all those charts as far as how we have the, those objective numbers to be able to hit at certain times of life, I do want to um, talk a little bit about something that I also think is fringe, at least on the Western side, is the idea of certain training units that should be applied for health for athletes. For example, some of the programs that we have uh, implemented at UNI that, that I've learned from uh, Peter that were discovered and developed and evolved in the Dekel Spine Institute in Russia, um, where all athletes should uh, do certain training units and do them as an addendum on top of their normal sport training or strength training. So I'm, I'm dealing with football athletes that, I mean, we're, we're lifting heavy loads, um, sometimes five days a week. Sometimes we're doing double, uh, double workouts, so double lifts. So they might get eight lifting sessions in a week. And we incorporate um, some of these deloading uh, workouts on the spine from the Decal Spine Institute that allow these athletes to train harder and help prevent injuries. So they're decompression workouts, um, decompressing the spine because so much of what we do as athletes is compression of the spine. Uh, yeah, I, think, you know, Jed, I think I think we we will be putting we will be putting the key routines in our second volume. The, yeah, the one that you're talking about. We have we have to yeah, but they're they're yeah. great. They're unbelievable. They're literally I can say anecdotally uh, for certain athletes they're life changing. There there's multiple athletes that came in as freshmen in college that football, as you know, it's a, com it's, it's a compression sport. So they're compressing the spine over and over again. It's, it's, it's like a car accident, you know, in, in every single game. Well, I've had multiple athletes that have come in that had pre-existing spine injuries that ha had pain and difficulty doing back squats or cleans. They love the game of football. They're on a scholarship, but they were limited into their participation in the training because of their injuries. And the crazy thing is, Yosef, is some of these athletes as a strength coach, you might think that maybe they're not mentally tough enough, that they're avoiding some of the difficult training. So they're having an excuse because I've seen, you know, thousands of excuses in my day as, as 25 years as a strength and conditioning coach difficult training, kids will go, oh, you know, this hurts or this bothers me. Well, what I found when we started implementing uh, some of these routines, as far as our, we call them recovery workouts, and they're great workouts, and, and you know, on top of that. But when we started uh, implementing these once a week, these injuries that these kids had pre-existing, when they came in the door, went away. And some of these athletes ended up getting near breaking records for their position on a back squat or a clean. So they are right up in the, you know, near the best numbers anybody that ever played their position in our history uh, were able to do, which is amazing to me. So then I, and I thought to myself that they weren't lying. These guys, they wanted to do it. They're tough kids, but they had real injuries that, they went away over time and they were able to integrate into our, our normal training and spine loading, heavy back squats, heavy cleans, heavy snatches, heavy pulls, heavy deadlifts, and have no trouble. So these are, this is like a one hour, one hour session. This integrates a yoga, uh, aerobic, uh, sports specific exercises from different countries and ancient, particularly, especially ancient uh, systems of Eastern um, um, fitness 
physical culture, physical Eastern culture. physical culture. Yeah, but we, we focused on, on putting together exercises that are strengthening your joints, all your joint tissues in your body. They strengthen it while stretching it. So you, you stretch it and then you strengthen it at the same time. And we're trying to build um, compound exercises so that you do it in the most efficient way. Uh, we created uh, a sequence. Sequence is very critical. This is another fringe in the West that, uh, that is coming to every participant. Sequence, how to um, put exercises in order so that you are rotating or integrating constantly stretching with strengthening okay and, and warming up certain areas of the body to allow for um more decompression uh, you know to release the spine in in certain uh periods as it's sequential uh heating up properly and then allowing you know the spine to elongate stretch and strengthen yeah it's it, it, you can feel it as you go through the step by step. So what we created with Jet, we created a, a routine that's uh, with your own body, mostly laying lay, laying on the floor. Uh, then we created a routine that is for the gym machines, also stretching, a lot of a lot of pulling, a lot of pulling and stretching, and while it's stretching, it's it's strengthening. And then we created uh, um, an equivalent for TRX ropes and an and, uh, almost identical uh, equivalent for uh, rubber bands and for using a partner. So we have a, um, um, a spectrum of modes going through a routine that is full body workout, all focused on strengthening while stretching and compounding it so you're doing it in the most uh, condensed period of time <laughs> so this is uh, important because in uh, for long term as, <coughs> as they compete and this must become their lifelong uh, routine so when they retire, they continue using these key exercises that keep them healthy. Most important, keep their spine, uh, uh, th their spine healthy because spine is is the most damaged, the most painful uh, in terms of n number, of mo more than half of the population, general population, uh, have back pain. So spine spine causes pain in 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 more than half of of average um mm -hmm. uh, overall population but uh, it, within, within within those who compete seriously for 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 serious athletes it could be close to 80 percent in certain sports uh, be, because of the compression because of the overload of the spine so this is the most important area for long-term athlete development where you strengthen and stretch and keep stimulated the spine, then um, different um, joints. So this is what we offer to uh, to the readers. Is the the most advanced collection of exercises for this in uh, in 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 uh, hopefully in the optimal put in optimal sequence that you can use for life after you after you retire. Yeah, and I want to expound on that a little bit, um, Peter. So I think it's important to understand that um, a lot of things that we do to develop these athletes, you wouldn't necessarily do outside of the realm of developing an athlete. Some of the training is very, very intense, and it prepares their body for, uh, again, football is is a uh, – it, it, it's it, – a very violent sport so you have to prepare the body to be able to handle those stresses that they're going to have within the game and um these these athletes become very very toughened 
and we have to go through a series of steps to train them to be able to withstand those type of impacts. Now, the general population doesn't necessarily need to train in, 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 in those ways, but um, in order to help us train these athletes in those ways, by adding on these addendums of these training units, we're able to get much, much more out of the athlete. Now, once they're done playing the sport, these are therapeutic workouts. And these, these workouts are designed to continue well after you're done playing. So you implement them to help you get the athlete through the training, help keep them safe, um, help them reach different levels in their training. And then beyond their training, it's, it's, they should just keep doing these. Probably they need to stop doing certain things that um, are not necessary anymore when they're done training to be a football player. There's no need to do certain types of training, uh, it, but this is recommended. Um, and the, the, the funny thing is, is certain things that we've done to develop either tactical athletes in the U.S., uh, you know, as far as in the military, or like football athletes that are in high compressive uh, games and sports, contact sports, have gravitated into the fitness industry, some of those training methodologies that maybe aren't the best thing for the general population to use. But these right here are, like Peter's saying, these will benefit anyone. And that's why, you know, the, the book is, is titled Fringe Methodology, Methodologies in High Performance and Health because certain things are used for high performance, certain things are used for health, and th there's certain things that should be integrated. And, and the nice thing about uh, these training units that Peter's referring to that we've implemented, they're coming out of uh, world-class uh, institutes like the Decal Spine Institute, where uh, you know Peter has gotten access to some of the top minds in the in this uh, field, and so they've used them in the uh, in the Russian sport developmental system, and we're we're probably the first university I would imagine in the United States that's implemented those type of training units and concepts with our athletes. I mean, am I right, Peter? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen uh, an integrated system like this uh, being being in being in place, and uh, I think we will we will continue with our, with the second volume of the book. We will continue to uh, to add to this uh, so that this can be described in uh, um, in a, in a more um, concise, uh, si simple way, so that uh, everybody can use it. Every every athletic program and every participant can 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 use it and use it. it uh, it's interesting uh, you know that you you talk about this I, I think that it, it, it as a lifelong plan because I, I know that that back in the beginning the Soviets were looking at it as a trying to develop a more resilient society in general uh, you know became part of the propaganda and they knew that uh, you know a healthier, physically healthier society was going to make them stronger as a nation in many different ways, uh, you know, more productive. Uh, it also uh, kind of helped to uh, promote, you know, some of the political uh, ideas. So they looked at it from that really long point of view from child all the way to, to the elderly. And, you know, the United States kind of had looked at that, I think in the sixties a little bit with uh, when Kennedy was in office, and then it just kind of went away, you know, and then as time progressed, it, 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 it really became, uh, I, I don't know what you say, it really kind of disappeared, I guess, because America had become pretty unfit in general um, and uh, kind of had lost our way. So you either had athletes or people who were totally sedentary and not doing anything. And as you said, I, you know, I worked in the, uh, in the field of treating uh, back problems, disorders, about 15 years ago. And I was amazed at the number of uh, back problems that there are uh, and to, 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 to really high degrees of severity and, uh, that are disabling. 
and a lot of them can be prevented. Uh, like from what you're, you're, you know, you're talking about, a lot of them can be prevented from just strengthening uh, the musculature around the low back. Some of the movements, like with yoga, tai chi, uh, uh, can also be valuable, and a couple other, you know, methods there, uh, you know, can be valuable. So it's it, it it's funny that it's fringe. It shouldn't be fringe. It should be standard operating <laughs> procedure. Yeah. Right? I mean, it really shouldn't be a fringe idea in the United States, but the reality is it, it is a fringe idea for sure. On the, on the, uh, on the uh, junior side or on the, you know, with the kids and stuff and young athletes, I think one of the things that really stands out is that in the United States, we, we play the sport a lot. So we'll have the kid, even at seven, play the sport a lot as the means to getting better. But uh, the thing that the Soviets did, and I think some other countries, uh, the GDR and some other places did really well, was they developed the athlete as a whole. You know, the, like you said, there was strength development. There was, uh, you know, endurance. You know, because at the younger ages, you'd really like to develop that aerobic capacity at a young age. Uh, you'd like to be able to develop skills, not sports-specific ideas, but general skills, like running. Uh, you know, throwing, kicking, things of this nature, um, and, and 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 all the while developing the athlete's strength and, and, and all the other different qualities, while maybe playing the sport a little bit, but not playing it nearly as much as what we do. Uh, Peter, could you talk about that real quickly, like how the Soviets would would look at that as far as the participation in the actual sport? How much you know? What what what? How did they divide that up? The uh, uh, long-term athletic development model and American development model that, that anybody can now um, look at uh, by going to websites of uh, national governing bodies. Um, they describe that at this early age, very important thing is, is the variety of sports and, and just uh, open and fun play. It's fun, it's, it's, it's time to have fun not to, to become too serious about it and uh, burn out. Um, but at the same time, it's critical <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to develop this uh, endurance, strength, flexibility, and coordination. Uh, so it's not, um, I, I, I think, um, it, it, it's not quite true to say, okay, serious training, um, is, is always gonna make your, your, your kids, um, um, you know, deprive them from fun. Uh, but right. it, 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 I think it, it, it's, it's more important to realize that all of this is, is, critically, uh, is critical. Play and fun is critical, but yeah. the medically, medically uh, driven uh, <clears throat> development of age appropriate endurance strength flexibility and coordination is must be integrated into this fun and that's and, and that's um to the to your point uh, of critical of importance of, of high level of pedagogical skills of coaches it's only a coach who is v very well educated and experienced can do it well can can integrate uh, age-appropriate running, uh, jumping, a bit of push-ups, a bit of pull-ups here and there, but all, overall um, make sure that at six years, seven years, and eight years of age, uh, uh, your children as they play and they, as they try maximum number of sports at, at this age, very important. Uh, they still develop uh, the, all, all the important components of, uh, the, uh, of their um, uh, fitness. And again, the, the, these tests that are at the end of the books, they, they, they give you the, re the requirements for this, um, uh, showing what you should not do. You should not go beyond five pull-ups for a seven-year-old, for example. Um, and other criteria, 
uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, these criteria were quite strict, and um, you you are not you, I mean you, you are not allowed or you are not strongly not recommended to um, to allow your children to lift weights, wrestle, and do other compressing um, exercises before before the the age of thirteen um, or, or sometimes earlier. Uh, you wouldn't. You you, sh you should not start um, loading loading the spine and doing uh, so. But still, it's it, it, it um, it's done. The very very strict rules uh, that that um, that have been in place um, <laughs> uh, have been compensated by uh, kind of a, 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 let's put it this way a, a relaxed approach to to, to compliance <laughs> to those rules. But they, these guidelines, um, these guidelines, I think, are very, uh, very important. As now we're becoming more and more uh, aware of this um, uh, <clears throat> parents push, yeah. uh, parents push uh, to uh, to start performing, to start competing too early, and um, because the scholarships. Uh, because of the f f f financial material awards are so vivid, uh, and mo more and more, um, um, uh, I think mo more and um, more and more um, accepted in in Western societies, uh, parents become become less and less uh, responsible, um, and and they they push their kids over the board and national governing bodies. Um, uh, organize competitions for kids that are too young, uh, competing at six years old, um, seven years, uh, seven years of age um, in countries like Norway, is is not allowed. Clubs clubs uh, would lose their permission to operate if they if they organize uh, um, competitions, stressful competition competitions for kids of this age. But in, in many other countries, it is it is uh, okay to, to push your kids to the limit uh, at, at, at early age. So um, while these guidelines are mentioned in, in, in our book, we're still searching for best practices in this um, long-term method development, particularly this early age. And I think uh, uh, countries like uh, Scandinavian countries um, uh, manage it very well. Why Norway is so, is so successful on the top, and why it is number one nation uh, by total medal count in in um, in uh, um, Winter Olympics, and they beat Canada and the United States and, and, and Russia. Amazing, small country is performing so uh, better than than countries with huge population populations uh, and and, uh, and gr uh, much greater resources. When one one reason is that they manage their early athlete development very carefully, and they um, and they really nurture their children um, from the very beginning, uh, they they do follow these guidelines that uh, uh, that we have on. Uh, very often we have them on paper, and we have them published. Uh, long-term method development guidelines, but you know, uh, we still do push kids to might not give them um, full spectrum of sports to try before we um, help them to specialize in in a discipline that we think is the most um, promising. Mm -hmm. But there is more and more research uh, showing that uh, if you're successful at age of ten. 12 and even 13, 14 years old, um, uh, it does not mean that you will be successful uh, at, the, at the age of 20. There is more uh, research and, um, uh, I, uh, the, yes, so th it, it's very important to, 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 to step back um, fr from this and um, look at Eastern European guidelines for long-term method development, look at Scandinavian and Northern European guidelines and practices now, 
and uh, revisit and constantly review uh, 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 review them and uh, try to advance advance and advance mm -hmm. and I, and I think that you know that is important and it's it's nice that in our book Peter that you, you know you have those charts that, that are translated uh, into English because it is some general guidelines as far as fitness and strength standards that you should be at through your uh, development as an athlete through your life long-term athletic development but then that multilateral approach we've known that for a long time that um, it's it develops the athlete much better um, you look at even small schools in the United States I'll give you one example a good friend of mine uh, Bryce Pop he is a uh, uh, famous American football player he's one of our coaches here at UNI he was the defensive MVP, most valuable player uh, in the NFL, um, you know, phenomenal uh, uh, American football player. But he grew up in a small town, and because he was in a small town, there was no specialization in his youth. They, he played all sports that were available because there wasn't enough kids. So he, he, it was funny, him and I were having a conversation about long-term athletic development in his development as an athlete, he goes, I never even heard of such a thing. Um, but there was no specialization because it was so small. It's like, you need to play basketball. You need to run track. You, you need to play baseball because we need you. You, we need, you need to be playing football. Um, every single sport that's – oh, and then when you're playing football, you need to play both sides. Um, you need to play everywhere because there, was, uh, there wasn't enough kids. So – he never heard of, of, of long-term athletic development. And then when he came to the university, he was behind. You know, he got his scholarship. He comes to play here at, at UNI, and he was a little behind at the beginning because he didn't specialize. But then he just rapidly evolved quickly to the point where he gets drafted in the NFL as one of the premier college players. And um, it's because, you know, as I discussed with him, he goes, now I realize how important my upbringing was where I had the opportunity to play everything and I was constantly playing multiple sports. You know, that's so, just one anecdote. Yeah, and there are quite a lot of examples uh, like this where, where athletes have been developed properly like this by luck. Just because yeah. they live close to YMCA or live, you <laughs> You live close to, to, to a school that has many sports offered, mm -hmm. and then you play. This now, if, this is what should be developed across the country in every region, in every ideal, in every suburb. There should be um, conditions for this multi 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 sport uh, opportunities for, for everybody. That's an in. In, in our uh, ide ideal future world, this is what we should strive for. Um, and and if, we, um, if we look into the future, this is what um, governments and uh, uh, sport organizations, national, national governing bodies and local sport organizations, local clubs should partner uh, to develop. Uh, and we, as, as participants, and, uh, and participants and coaches uh, uh, and as parents, we should realize this one important thing that we are using this um, um, Eastern European concepts uh, as the most advanced, most, most, most specific, most sophisticated skills. Um, and we look at them as um, um, tools for selecting athletes and we are we are looking for answers in this, in this practices that would help them help us to identify the most optimal food for um, our child uh, or um, our participant and the most optimal specialization right based on the tests um, we know that there are uh, physiological tests the, now there are genetic tests that help you identify optimal sport in which you're going to be successful and optimal position. Um, yes, in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, 
uh, you would be taken um, through uh, anthropometry testing and uh, later on you would be uh, it would be biopsy uh, test uh, of your muscles to see whether you're going to be you know on the most basic level the you know your, your muscle is either showing um, as, as as short or, or, or long uh, 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 potential so short means that you're going to be strong strong and and, and and fast <laughs> long means you're going to be more you know um, uh, enduring and aerobically able athlete these are examples of of different tests yes tests uh, have been used tests are used by chinese now extensively we did we discuss it in our book but the most important thing for uh, for coaches uh, uh, for, that coach youth is to realize that this testing has been multi-year multi-year testing not one-off test but it, but tests uh, that are physiological and psychological that are integrated into many years of developing an athlete. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you you you're filtering, you're calling your 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 talent through many years of not only testing but expert observation. And this again, this expert observation must be done by experienced coaches. And these coaches and they must not dismiss and this is what's been happening in the Soviet Union and that's what happened with me no one told me uh, drop out uh, I was told many times this is not your optimal sport you have to move to the discipline where you're gonna be more successful and healthier for life this concept is critically important for both uh, developing uh, high performance athletes, but also for developing healthier populations where our genetic tests, physiological tests, various blood tests, and uh, uh, psychological tests help us identify activities where we're going to be not just successful as athletes but we're going to be healthy for life mm -hmm. I, I i want to add a little bit there and, and and kind of go back in the conversation a little bit too um there's an important component even at the at the at the peak of the pyramid when you're an elite athlete that a lot of times is forgotten the fact that it shouldn't all be just specificity training. We have a multilateral approach uh, with young athletes at the beginning, at the base, as we develop them over time. But even at the top, we, we need to make sure that they're doing things outside of that sport to develop coordination, um, you, you know, their rhythm, their timing, uh, things that still develop them as an athlete. For example, in uh, – Beijing at the Olympic Training Center uh, when I was uh, watching their, their weightlifters that were preparing for the 2008 game, games. Every single day they would have these athletes add training units of table tennis, ping pong. And so these are world-class weightlifters that you wouldn't think that there's any hand-eye coordination or timing but there is it's, it's a very quick movement the sport of weightlifting in a millisecond and it's a strength and power sport here they're having these athletes part of their training is they are playing ping pong working on rhythm timing coordination um as a cool down and it was part of their regular training um these ideas i can go back in time to uh, the 1960s in the united states but when i first started working for the minnesota vikings in the old training center that they had doesn't exist anymore called winter park 
their old facilities were built in 1968. When I went in there um, next to the strength and conditioning center, they had these rooms that were not being used anymore. And the old athletic trainer came to me and he was there from the onset of the Vikings in 1968. And he goes, hey, let me show you something. And he goes to these rooms and he says, what are, what are these? And opens them up, filled with boxes of storage. And I said, storage. And he goes, no. He goes, we've gone away from the simple concepts we used to know in the United States and apply. He goes, these are racquetball courts, general physical training for elite athletes on the side of the sport of football. We had these athletes back in the 1960s incorporate racquetball training just for coordination, timing, reflexes, agility, on the side of football. And he goes, we don't do this anymore in America for America. Everything is so Everything specific. Is specific. It's all sports specific, all sports specific at the uh, at at most the, elite uh, levels. Level. And we don't incorporate multilateral, multilateral approach, which we know that we should. We should. Um, so uh, when I was so working when, with the NHL players, um, when I was at, you know with the Minnesota Wild, I would incorporate badminton one day a week, just working on some reflexes. Uh, rhythm, timing, coordination outside. And obviously, if you know anything about badminton, that birdie, the shuttlecock, is the fastest implement in sport. It goes faster than a baseball pitch. It goes faster than a hockey uh, slap shot. But very, very fast with, with world-class uh, shuttlecocks when you get the, the Olympic caliber ones. And these guys are developing great skills. Part of their training outside of the strength training, speed work, agility work, and so forth, but you need to think about implementing, even at the top of the pyramid, they still need to develop as an athlete, train their minds, uh, train their bodies in different ways. And we know that from research that was done in the Soviet Union years ago. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's something that isn't practiced all the time. Guys, I appreciate uh, – all the information here kind of drawing that picture. I think that the takeaway for everybody is, is that, you know, when you're looking at developing an athlete, it's, it's a process over a protracted period of time, if not a lifetime. And so when you begin to develop an athlete, I think the things that are different in the U S that probably, you know, this would make a trend in the United States is a lot of people look at things in the United States as a program for this amount of weeks or months or whatever and not looking at it as trying to get gradual improvement over the length of the athlete's career. You know, if he's 10, 12 years old, you know, the Soviets would look at it and say, well, where, where, do, where should he be at when he's 25? You know, looking at it a decade later or even further out. And uh, we, we don't really do that. And I think one of the points that you made uh, earlier, Peter, is really critical for the American audience to hear is that just because a kid at 13 is really good is no indicator of where he's going to be at as an adult. So you have to be looking at that long-term strategy, not presuming uh, that he's going to be excellent later on because of the development maturation uh, paces are, are vastly different. And uh, each kid, you know, still needs to master the physical uh, components, the physical abilities and attributes uh, of, of fitness overall, and then diving into the sport, uh, you know, more fully. So I think that the critical components are is, is to see that in the long term, the picture. It's, it's not, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a short thing. Uh, and playing more does not uh, indicate, is not an indication of be, mastering the sport. It's more of the overall development. It's not playing more at the younger ages or specializing. Not, and, and specialization, you know, I, I, I think the biggest problem with it is, is that it's not so much that it's specialized, is that it's over-volumized. There's too much time spent on it, too many games played or too many practices specific on the sport. And this is where the athlete might get injured, burnt out, or just, you know, start to see an impediment. Uh, to their progress overall uh, with the with with in the absence especially of the physical uh, fitness development that should be going on during that phase and it should be appropriate I'm I've 
I work as a consultant at a school and we're using that in a dis in a, uh, the whole district and looking at it when I t when I look at a kid in the fifth grade I'm saying well where does he want to be when he's in 12th grade when he leaves here where you know would he like to be able to get a scholarship in a particular sport can we develop him up to the level where he could be scholarship eligible in multiple sports because he has that base of athleticism that will translate you know, under multiple sports, if, if if he so desires, right? It gives him uh, it gives him a lot of alternatives and choices, or or or, or young ladies. So, uh, I appreciate you guys filling in on this. This has been uh, really good uh, uh, talk on this subject, man. We're going to take it further. Obviously, um, we we want to dive into all the other particulars of the physical training and the long term athletic development. But uh, I appreciate you guys' time today, though. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank yep, you. Thanks, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Joseph. Yep. Talk to you guys later. Thank you. Thanks.